Hello, welcome back to Everard Junction. Today we're going to start doing some ballasting on the main and relief lines. Okay, so uh, I've had the track, as you know, installed for some time and obviously I've run the trains uh, quite a lot, so I know the track is going to be reliable. Um, that is one of the most important things to consider uh, before you ballast the track. You need to make sure that the trains run smoothly, there's no derailments, there's no bumps, there's no undulations or any issues that you can see um, with your track work. Um, once you've ballasted your track, it is not impossible, but it is quite a bit more difficult to affect maintenance and perform various repairs that you otherwise could have intercepted before you ballasted the, the track work. So at the moment I've got all four lines running with a variety of stock and I'm just making sure that everything looks right and runs right. So far there have been no derailments, I can quite happily leave these running all day unattended and uh, they won't derail. So reliability we know is there, it's going to uh, still work properly after I've ballasted it. Um, but uh, what I'm looking at now is just any bumps and things that uh, visually I might not be happy with as the trains run over this area. So we're just looking along the track work, anything that sticks out, anything that's uneven. I need to pay particular attention on this layout as I'm using banking on the curves. And there are transitions from the banking back onto the flat. I want to make sure that uh, that's nice and smooth. In the background over the last few months I have applied various shims and bits and pieces to the track to improve bumps and undulations. You can see one just there where that particular line had a low spot. There will be a video coming soon about these Backman container wagons. One of the most impressive wagons I've ever bought. I'm very, very pleased. As I say, I've got a video in the works about those. Okay, well, enough of the running of the trains. We'll uh, get those parked up and uh, then we'll start doing some ballasting. Okay, first thing we're going to do is not do any ballasting immediately. That is a classic mistake that so many people make, and I made it on the original layout. You just get excited and you just want to put ballast everywhere. Remember the track infrastructure, the cable troughing, the catch pits, anything else that you might be adding, um, signals and whatever. Um, adding them now, it's a lot easier to do the ballasting afterwards rather than having to keep digging bits of ballast up to add bits of detail in later that you'd forgotten to install in the first place. Okay, the first piece is going in. This is the uh, cable troughing. Little kit made by Scale Model Scenery, which you've seen previously. Over here, this is what it looks like when it's completed. Particularly like being able to see the wires inside. So I've decided to run that along the outside there. Did a bit of research, it's relatively uncommon to see the uh, cable trunking running in between uh, two busy lines. Uh, sometimes you would see it between the running line and a siding, um, but uh, between uh, the main and relief lines here, perhaps not the most uh, prototypical thing in the world. Um, most of the pictures I've seen and most of the places I've been in real life, it is usually to one side. I've put the cable trunking up on some cork, as you can see there. It's the same cork I've used for the uh, track bed as a very very loose rule and um, there are examples of uh, various different configurations of cable trunking all over the country um, but as a general rule if you can get the lids at about the same height as the sleepers that'll stand you in good stead and roughly represent the general um, British Rail Network although there are various different uh, configurations out there. Over here we have a, uh, a place for a point motor so uh, I shall uh, install that and the uh, associated cosmetic cabling um, going over to the cable trunking. It's important to try and add as much stuff as you can before you do the ballasting. You'll notice I bust the spring out of um, this point, but it doesn't matter because quite fortunately trains always travel in that direction. So as soon as they run over, it just does that. Obviously once that point is motorised from underneath, it won't matter. 
Okay, so uh, before I get started on ballasting, I have just uh, tried out some of the different colours on a scrap piece here. I've got about seven or eight different colours to use on the layout, and I've bought them from two different manufacturers, um, the idea being that uh, I can combine the two to create some interesting effects. I'm using a fine blend. You want to try and use as fine a blend as possible. If you think about the size of a stone versus the size of a railway sleeper, um, they really are quite small in real life, so it's important to try and use a nice fine ballast. So the stuff here is uh, Woodland Scenics. Um, this is the ballast I prefer to use. I used it on the whole of the previous layout, and I've never really had any problems with it. Always had good results. And then I've also bought some of the new Hatton's ballast, as it's a relatively new product to the market. I thought I'd give it a go. Um, they should complement each other quite nicely. You can see, just even with those six, we've got quite a range of different colours. The Woodland Scenic stuff is not made of real stone, it's made from some other material, I'm not exactly sure which, um, and you can see it's a very nice fine blend, and it looks very effective. The Hatton stuff is made of real stone, and you can see it's a little bit coarser. I should be able to use that to my advantage, as on the real railway, the grade of ballast varies. Um, I've seen plenty of pictures where the uh, ballast is quite fine, and then just across the other side, um, the stones are considerably more coarse. So I'm happy with the colours, uh, it's just a matter now of uh, hoping that uh, the plan works and that when I blend various different colours together it looks good. Something I've noticed about the Hatton's ballast is it is uh, a little bit dusty and that's because it's made from real stone. You can see there is a slight dusty effect, you can see the dust in there. It's not massively obvious, um, it is a little bit more obvious on this one here, try and get it to focus. You can just see the little bits of dust on the stones there. Now for me I'd like to get rid of that, so what I'm doing is washing the ballast before I use it. Okay, that's more like it. Water's running clear. Ballast is nice and clean. You can already see just how much it's brought out the colours. Okay, they're all washed. It's brought out the colours considerably leave those to dry naturally if I have enough time or I can uh, stick them on a baking tray in the oven. Here's the ballast after it's been washed. I just uh, baked it in the oven for about an hour or so, carried on with the layout in the meantime and you can see that it's now nice and clean and it just generally looks a lot better. You don't have to do it but uh, I felt it was worth doing for me and for this layout, and you can see the effect there. So it's entirely up to you. It only takes 10 minutes to wash it, stick it in the oven to dry it out, or just leave it for a couple of days and it will dry naturally. Okay, well, uh, let's get started. I have uh, enough detail installed that I'm, I'm happy with how things look. I haven't officially decided where all of the signals are going to be going on the layout yet, so um, I am going to take the decision um, to add those in afterwards. And yes, it will require a little bit of work, but I'm quite happy to uh, to put up with that. I'd rather have the layout ballasted um, in the meantime. So I'm going to go with a combination of the Hattons and Woodland Scenics uh, ballast. Uh, you can see I already ballasted the, uh, the branch line over here, um, that needs a little bit more adding to it, so I'm looking forward to adding some of the browns and, and lighter sort of buff colours uh, to create that varied effect. As I said at the beginning of the video, I think uh, the original layout made the mistake of using the same ballast all over the place, and in the real world that just doesn't happen. Different grades and colours are all over the place on almost every stretch of line.
So what I'm trying to do is make the, uh, the ballast on the uh, relief lines look uh, older. You can see there's a lot more brown in it. I've used some of the Woodland Scenics um, brown fine ballast, mixed it in with the, uh, the grey and the darker grey, and just created a sort of older looking track bed. And then by contrast, the, uh, the main lines, they look uh, not new, but they look newer. You know, the, the last... The last time anybody did any maintenance over here, it was certainly on this side of the railway and not this side. So I've been quite careful to make sure that the ballast goes in the correct places. You can see there isn't any on top of the uh, sleepers in this location. I'll show you a little tip to uh, just help settle things down. Uh, if you have any Oxford die-cast um, vehicles, chances are you have the boxes for them, and this is one of those. And this is very similar to what they do on the real railway, although they use a machine and not this. Just uh, go along like that. The vibration makes sure that the ballast rolls off of the sleepers. As it settles, you can see there are a couple of places that are a little bit thin in terms of ballast. They need some more. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over that with a different colour later um, to give that effect of um, the random assortment of ballast and you know fresh ballast has just been applied as and where it's needed. Okay, I might as well uh, make sure everything still works. No reason why you can't run the trains over the loose ballast before you glue it. So uh, I'll just check everything is okay and then we'll go ahead and glue it down. There's loads of different ways that you can glue this down. I've tried various different methods and today I'm going to use some isopropyl alcohol, an eyedropper and a 50-50 mix of PVA glue and water with just a quick splash of washing up liquid just to help the, uh, the solution soak into the ballast. Uh, using the isopropyl alcohol to pre-wet the area first makes things a lot easier and because it comes out of an, uh, this little bottle in a nice fine mist um, it shouldn't disturb the ballast too much as I spray. Okay, I've finished applying all of the glue. Just going to quickly check that the points still work. The points do indeed still work, so now the trick is to just leave it. Avoid the temptation to touch it, do anything with bits you're not happy with. It'd be far easier to rectify stuff after it has dried. Just while it's wet, leave it and let it dry. It's been about 12 hours, the ballast is nearly dry, but uh, I'm going to avoid the temptation to do anything with it yet. I'm just going to continue on to the next bit. You'll notice as well I've added some brown ballast to the branch line. The ballast here was a little thin in places and that was deliberate as I knew I'd probably end up coming back with a different colour to give it some more interesting effects. It certainly looks different, it's an unusual effect and obviously it's not something I've tried before. But uh, so far I'm quite happy. This is only the first stage of the process. Of course the airbrush needs to come out and there needs to be some weathering. So some of the bits that are perhaps a little bit like, oh that's a bit in your face, will get um, toned down. And uh, I'm really going to experiment with the weathering techniques here too. But before I do any of that, I need to wait for it to dry. So I'm just going to continue working the ballast around the curve. I've brought the cable trunking up to uh, this area so we've got about another metre and a half worth of layout to ballast 
and I've also installed some more catch pits. The little piece of plastic card is just to give them a little bit of a boost off of the surface of the baseboard so they don't get swamped with the ballast when I install it. And of course it goes without saying whilst I'm doing all of this I'm taking the time to make sure that any sleepers that have come loose and moved slightly in their position are put back straight. It'd be a real shame to ballast all of it and have not uh, noticed that uh, certain sleepers are wonky. So while we wait for that boatload of ballast to dry, I thought I'd mention the uh, Worley Model Railway Club's forthcoming open day. Uh, the club has a couple of open days a year where they open the club rooms up to the general public and the next one is on Sunday the 7th of July and it's open from 11am. Myself and a couple of other Model Railway YouTubers will be in attendance and uh, there's going to be a little uh, diorama competition between us which should be good fun and there'll be the usual selection of layouts and stuff on display from the Wally Club as per their usual open days. Should be a good day, looking forward to the competition and uh, if you're interested in going I look forward to uh, seeing you there on the day. Okay well the uh, glue on this section has now dried, it took two days for it to dry in the end but you have to bear in mind I'm using a ridiculous quantity of ballast. The super elevation on the track means that uh, the ballast on the far side here you can see um, there's quite a lot of depth to it so it has used a serious quantity of ballast and a serious quantity of glue. I've ended up using six different colours it might actually be seven different colours I can't remember now but uh, it's certainly varied. So the next thing to do now before weathering it is to just get rid of any loose bits and pieces you're always going to end up with bits on top of the sleepers and bits along the side of the rail. There's some along the side of the rail, there's some on top of the sleepers. Just use a screwdriver and you'll be able to uh, scrape most of it off. Okay, cleaned all the loose stones off of the uh, top of the sleepers. I have left a couple of bits and pieces on the, uh, the bits of the sleepers that stick out to the sides and just left the, uh, the centres nice and clear. A little bit of extra realism. Um, if you want to, there are examples in the real world of um, this side of the, uh, 
of the track, um, having its sleepers completely buried. Um, that's often the case when um, ballast has been relayed over the course of a weekend perhaps when the line was closed for maintenance. Um, the engineering crews don't always have time uh, to come and uh, smooth the ballast out nice and neatly, especially along the sides. They'll make sure the middle is clear because that's where the train's going to be running and this side can be very, very messy. Uh, that's more of a situation that comes up in the, the, the railway of today, uh, but I thought it was worth mentioning. It is, a, it is an effect you can do, but it's worth bearing in mind it's typically seen with fresh ballast. Next thing I'm going to do is just go and refill any areas where I've missed. There are a couple of places here and there where you can see the baseboard and the cork. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then uh, once that's dry, we can commit to weathering some of this. Something you can try, which I've done here, is uh, when you do this uh, process, force yourself to use a different colour. Just like in the real world, when they patch up ballast, it will be a different colour to what was already there. OK, well I've been having a bit of an experiment on the, this piece of track here. It's always good to uh, try something new before you actually do it on the layout. And uh, little scrap pieces like this are ideal. So in the past I always uh, airbrushed uh, my track. Uh, for the weathering and uh, I'm going to be doing that again this time round um, but one of the things that I noticed when I uh, airbrushed the track is if I want to paint the sides of the rail I've really got to you know lay the weathering on thick so we end up with the uh, the rail being weathered to the, the sort of finish that I want but you end up with the ballast either side being you know almost the same colour as the rail being really quite brown now, while that is uh, prototypical in a lot of places, I'd like to experiment with some different techniques this time round. So this time I'm going to paint the rails first and then airbrush the weathering over the top of that. And it should allow me to preserve some of the coloration and differences that I've got in the ballast on the railway. So I've mixed up um, some acrylic paints and I've basically ended up with sleeper grime. So I should have just used that in the first place. But um, I've painted that on and uh, it's now drying off. I'm quite happy with the effect. Um, when you paint the rails, obviously, you're always going to get um, paint onto the little twists of metal um, that hold the rail onto the sleeper. And actually, in real life, that is prototypical. Um, the, the rail is made of metal, and so is the little twist thing that holds it to the sleeper. So the sleeper is made of concrete, it's not going to rust, um, but the, uh, the rail and the fixings that hold it to the sleeper will rust and you end up with this really nice effect as you look down the line. And we've preserved the colour of the ballast. Now having said that, this is obviously still far too clean. Um, so I'm going to airbrush over the top now and experiment with a couple of effects on this little test piece here. Okay, there we go, done a little bit of weathering experimentation. Quite pleased with the results. So at this end, what I've tried to do is uh, a relatively light weathering to the ballast, as you can see. And then inside um, the, uh, the gauge of the track, um, you can see it's really quite filthy. And uh, I've seen that in so many places and so many photographs. If the track's been down for a couple of years, this is usually what happens to it. Over here I've gone for something a little bit more recent, a bit more fresh perhaps, and you can see the effects there. It just uh, brings out the colour of the ballast a little bit more. What I've done on this end instead is I have dirted with a sort of oily black um, that running rail just there, and this is to represent something I'm going to try and do on the corners. I've seen a number of photographs and places in real life where uh, one of the rails is really quite filthy, almost a jet black, and then the other one is not. And you see this um, usually in areas where automatic greasers have been installed. 
An automatic greaser is a device that's used to extend the life of running rails in places where uh, relatively high speed and curves are being used. Uh, you'll have the device at the side of the line, say like that, and um, as the train uh, comes along the track, um, it will depress a mechanism that squirts an amount of grease onto the rail that's going to be uh, getting the, uh, the biggest punishment from the train going around the curve. The train will then carry that grease with its wheels further into the curve and the idea then is that that will um, extend the life of that particular running rail. Obviously a side effect of this, having one of the rails covered in grease all the time, means that it attracts a huge amount of filth and you end up with one side being almost jet black and the other side being relatively clean. I think it looks quite interesting so I'm certainly going to give it a go in a couple of places. I'll also have to make a proper model of the automatic greaser so I can justify what I've done. OK so with that I'm going to go back to the layout and uh, start doing some of the weathering. Uh, hoping that uh, I can achieve something that looks a little bit like that in a number of places. Okay, well, that was boring, but uh, I think you'll agree it does look quite good. I've also painted both sides of the rail. Um, I'm quite fond of putting the camera on the other side of the track to get some different shots, and as the layout is quite low down, um, you can, if you, if you stand up in the room and look at the layout, you are looking down onto the track, so you are going to be able to tell if um, both sides have been weathered or not. Um, some layouts, um, the original layout for example, I could get away with weathering only the side of the track that you could see, uh, but in this case it is visible from various different angles, so I have weathered both sides of the rail. You can see the difference that uh, painting the rails uh, makes. There we have the four lines all painted, and then there they are unpainted, apart from the uh, closest track obviously, that one there. But you can see the difference. It, it's, it, you wouldn't think that it would do very much to the overall effect, but actually the visual impact is huge. So now it's time to get the airbrush out and start weathering. Uh, this process can be a bit frightening if you've not done it before. Um, in all seriousness, you can't really get this wrong. There are so many different examples of track weathering out there. Uh, I myself have poured over hundreds, maybe even thousands of photographs, and it ranges from really quite clean and presentable to absolutely filthy. So you can't really get this wrong. If you don't put enough paint on, that's prototypical. And if you put far too much paint on and the thing ends up looking uh, really oily and horrible, um, that's prototypical as well. Um, you really can't get it wrong. It's just a matter of personal taste and what you want to do and what you think looks good. I'm going to try and stick to a basic rule here um, that is to have the uh, the fast lines or the main lines I should say, uh, the main lines in the background um, looking a bit newer so the weathering's not going to be quite so heavy. You can see by the tones of ballast I've selected I'm trying to make those main lines look a bit newer and then the relief lines closer to the camera, um, I'm going to weather those more heavily, give them more of an aged look, and then we'll have two tracks that are quite clean, two tracks that are more dirty, should look quite interesting. I'm also gonna try, you know, maybe even one of the four is dirtier than the other three. We'll experiment.
Okay, well, there we go. That's the sort of thing that I was hoping to achieve. I think I've got reasonably close. Of course, you'll have your own style and your own preference. Um, this is what I've decided to do. It doesn't by any means mean that you should do it as well. Um, when you come to airbrushing it, it's entirely up to you. You can be very light and gentle, or you can go much further than this and make the place look really grotty and run down. So what I like is um, we've got the main lines in the background. They're quite clean. They're not, they're not too weathered at all. I've just used Railmatch Sleeper Grime, and then you can see the relief lines closer to the camera. They're really a lot more worn down. Um, the painting of the rails has paid off. You can see that that effect shows through more than anything else. I'm pleased I've done that. Um, I've just done some rail match straight black um, down the middle of uh, the two relief lines and uh, similar to a lot of pictures basically is what I've copied there and I think the, uh, the effect is quite interesting. So basically what I've tried to do is I've tried to get the best of both worlds. We've got a heavy weathering, we've also got a light weathering. The two side by side I think complement each other to a certain degree. You can also see that one of the lines, the second one down, is um, the cleanest. So we, it's not, it's not a manufactured finish. Not you know, the other, all four are not exactly the same. So the furthest line, that's got a bit more brown to it. The next one in, that's really quite clean. Mostly the painted um, rails show through and very little else. And then the two closest to the camera, are a little bit closer to each other, but uh, they're generally much heavier in terms of weathering. It's all about trying to get that bit of variety. This is by no means finished. There'll be little isolated areas of detail to add after this. It's a nice contrast with the point work as well. You can really go crazy when it comes to point work. Do as much weathering as you like. I've seen plenty of points at stations and other places in real life where they're pretty much just jet black and there's little else to see. You can also see the weathering here on the little bits of detail. Just about see the uh, orange tubes there and here they're considerably more visible. A shot just to give you an idea of how things are going to look in the long term. Uh, 47 is just just coming onto the uh, banking on the curves. You see the banking is starting sort of about here. And, uh, I'm quite pleased with that. That's not bad at all. I'll clean the paint off the top of the rails just with a, a Pico uh, track rubber. Now I don't like using these but it is the quickest and easiest way uh, to get rid of the paint off the top of the rails. Uh, I usually clean the track using the CMX track cleaner. I avoid using track rubbers for actually cleaning things. But uh, they do a nice job of getting the excess paint off the surface of the rails so that the trains will run again. And you can see even just doing that makes quite a big visual impact to uh, how the overall scene actually looks. And you can see an example of the clean track. Still complements the weathered locomotive, still clearly looks weathered, looks used. But it's got that newish sort of appearance to it. And then I have the nice contrast of the uh, weathered track, or more heavily weathered track, uh, closer to the camera. Okay, well that's the uh, the ballast dry and weathered on uh, this uh, first of the two big sweeping bends. And uh, you can see I've had a go at doing the, uh, the greasy rail on the far side of the curve. 
You can see over here I have experimented a little bit further with the addition of some different colours of ballast. Um, here we have a sort of mid-grey on the main lines. And if we go back to the bit I did earlier, that's uh, not a mid-grey, it's more of a, a lighter uh, sort of colour. And they sort of blend together a bit here and then it changes colour. Just trying to create that sort of you know varied effect as well as using different colours in a mix across the area. I'm trying to use different mixes of colours in different places around the layout so it's not all the same blend. We've got the first train running. Got a speed restriction in place at the moment so it's only running slowly. The ballast increases the amount of noise that the train makes but as far as I'm concerned that's a good thing. You can't beat the clickety-clack noise. So here we are on the far side. You can see I have indeed weathered on both sides as uh, I film the layout a lot and I don't know where I'm going to put the camera so it's important to uh, make sure I haven't missed anything out. You can see the cable trunking down here as well. Obviously the lids are missing at the moment. Details to come for that. I've used a lot of ballast. Hopefully you can make out there in the middle. The ditch. That's uh, quite a realistic effect. You'll see it in a lot of photographs pleased I was able to replicate it, although it is costing a bit of money and to buy quite a lot of ballast. Okay, well I've been uh, very busy doing lots of ballasting and adding various bits of detail. It's taken quite a while and there's still some weathering to do, but uh, I have now ballasted quite a large part of the layout. So the ballast now runs all the way over from where the, uh, the small depot is, right the way around the sweeping bend over this section that you've seen me do previously, over the point work, and now moving into this sweeping bend. So over here I've experimented with some uh, more effects. You can see I've uh, represented a bit of uh, relayed track. I uh, decided to make uh, the relief lines here uh, relayed. I didn't want them super weathered and dirty all the way around the layout, trying to create that bit of variation. So that's the latest bit I've just done. Just got to wait to, uh, for that to finish drying off and I will uh, weather uh, the rails and do a little bit of light air brushing to that. And that will then uh, just be another little bit of scenic interest on this section of the layout. I'm also experimenting and uh, messing around with a little bit of ground cover in between the tracks here as there is uh, a fair bit of space uh, between the two to make uh, room for the uh, reversing siding that's just uh, over to the left. That's not finished yet, still experimenting and uh, I'll update you with that once I've uh, done the ballasting on the other side and completed this area. Over here I've been busy I've added some more relay boxes, always like the relay boxes, nice little bit of detail, and I've also added a security 
uh, railing from scale model scenery just as a bit of uh, health and safety to stop anybody working in those boxes falling over the edge of the retaining wall. Here's the ballasting over on this far side of the layout. You can see I've completed the weathering as well. It took a long time. You don't really realise how big the layout is until you start ballasting it. It has taken ages. So there's still plenty to do, but uh, I'm going to leave it there. That'll do for this video, and I'll be back as soon as I can with the uh, next part of the layout build series. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed that one. It certainly took quite a long time to put that one together. A lot of ballasting, a lot of waiting for glue and stuff to dry. But uh, I'm very pleased with the results. And uh, there's been a few other bits and pieces I've done as well, which I will cover in a future layout update. So as always, thank you for watching. And if you want to see more 1980s model railway stuff, then feel free to check out Dave from Dean Park Station. And there's a link on the screen.